let us pray. Praise the King, the God who from before time chose his kingdom and the exact time that they live. Praise the King who calls into his kingdom sinners and rebels and the war-worn and broken-spirited, who gives them everlasting life and his own spirit of freedom and boldness. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you in praise, we confess that we are daunted by the fears and concerns of the world rather than trusting and obeying you. We confess that we try to impress and fit in with the world rather than loving you alone and setting ourselves to serve you. We confess and ask forgiveness and the Spirit's abiding in us that we might be made godly and holy as we desire. Thank you for forgiving us our sins, for providing new life through Jesus and giving us a call and a place in his kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that we need not fear what the world around us fears, but trust that you will bring us safely through everything into your heavenly kingdom. We thank you for bringing us this far and all the goodness that we have known in our lives and see in the world. We bless you for. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 6 and verses 1 to 11. Let us hear God's word. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and minds. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, help us in our sorrows and keep us through the griefs of the world, 
lift our hearts with the certainty of your loving presence and give us an eager expectation of the fulfilment of all your promises. Father, help each who suffers with illness today. Spur on and encourage those who work in our hospitals and in medical care. Make them diligent and inspired in knowing the good that they do and reward them for every kind word and deed. Heal us from our sickness of body and heal us in our minds with the light of your truth and heal our spirits with the presence of your Holy Spirit. For those struggling in war, in conflict and in fear, we pray. For those in hunger and desperation, we pray. For those in hurt and confusion of thought, we pray. We pray that you would deliver them to safety, to hope and to healing and freedom, according to your mercy and wisdom. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others their trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning and a warm welcome to you and welcome if you are joining later through our YouTube recording. If any one of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. This passage might surprise Christians today. The idea that you might not use state courts to decide matters is striking. That's not to say that if a law has been broken, the courts of the state do not deal with it. They should and will. This is about the Christians in Corinth going after each other through the courts, suing one another. Coming from the issue of removing from the fellowship a man in a sinful relationship, Paul now moves to other judging matters between Christians. It should be remembered, though, that while there is a connection of judging matters, the reason Paul turns to this is the factions and the disagreements in Corinth, and these have come even to lawsuits among them. Paul begins to deal with this by shocking them into remembering who they are in Christ Jesus. And this is important. The main line that Paul is going to take with them here is the difference between the worldly thinking they seem to be living by and the reign of the kingdom of God that they are actually in now. These two, the world's reign in your heart, and the reign of Christ in your heart, are very different from each other. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life Here are some scriptures that tell us of the kingdom of God that is going to come and our place within it. In Daniel 7, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. Matthew 19, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 2 Timothy 2. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Revelation 2. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. Revelation 3. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, 
just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. It seems clear from Revelation 7 and the others that what is intended is that under the reign and judgments of Jesus, all rulers will worship and obey him. It is not courts of judgment, but rule under Christ's rule that is pictured. We will carry out his judgments and rule under his rule in the kingdom that is to come. This is what Paul reminds the Christians in Corinth about. He does this so as to shock them and shame them into realizing who they are in Christ and remembering Christ's reign in their hearts. I hope you're shocked too, it shocks me. God has not only saved us through death and resurrection in Jesus, but in Jesus is building a kingdom of people whose hearts are like the heart of his son Jesus. A people who will not reign over, but rather not a people he will reign over, but that he will reign in and through. In him and with him we will reign. Can you see how impossible it is that in a kingdom like that there should be lawsuits between his people? But you might say we're living in this fallen world now. How shall we deal with things here? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, says Paul, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. The basic idea is that Christians should be able to judge matters between themselves. They ought not to need to take each other to court, since the reign of Christ is in all of them. Well then, if you do need to judge a matter, couldn't one or more Christians help sort that out? Of course they could. But that is not really the point of Paul's challenge to them. That's not the point. His challenge is not about how to judge a dispute. In fact, he says, the very least could do that. It is about how they got into the dispute in the first place. When Paul says to shame you, he means, I do not really think that you can't find anyone wise enough to judge a dispute between you. I am sure that you could. In fact, I am sure that any one of you could. I am saying that cannot be the reason that you go to court against each other. The reason you go to court is much worse The reason you don't resolve the matter together is that you are not prepared to. You do not want to. So if you do not want to, who is in charge of your heart? If you really wanted to resolve the dispute, whatever it is, you could get anybody to help resolve it. The problem is you don't want to resolve the dispute and you should want to. One of Paul's concerns here is that taking a fellow Christian to court tells people outside the church that Christians do not love each other and don't desire to resolve issues. They want to beat each other just like everybody else. But how it looks to others is not Paul's main concern. We are about to find out Paul's main concern. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. What Paul says in verses 7 and 8 might not make sense to a worldly way of thinking, it should make sense to a kingdom God way of thinking. The fact that there were lawsuits among them meant that their hearts were set on all the wrong things, worldly thinking, 
It meant that instead of the reign of Christ and grace over their hearts and minds, they still conducted their thinking and desire according to worldly priorities and thoughts. You don't have to go as far as lawsuits. When Christians harbor grudges against one another, it is the same. It's just a lawsuit in your head. And Paul says, you aren't winning anything there. That's complete defeat. The questions Paul puts forward strike really deeply. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? I can think of reasons I would rather not be wronged. I can think of reasons I would rather not be cheated. And I'm sure you can. I bet you and I could make an argument that right and wrong and justice and standing up for oneself are all important. Here's the thing, though. Jesus gave up all these things. His rights, his personal justice, standing up for himself. And he accepted all our wrongs. He entrusted all of that to his Father and went ahead and saved us. And we are meant to have his reign in our hearts, in our wills. Indeed, the only righteousness that we have is him. If justice was done, we would not be able to stand in the court. So just what do we think we are trying to prove over our brothers and sisters? The change which Jesus brings to our minds and hearts gives us an entirely new way of seeing everything. We look at our lives and the whole world in a different way. We value different things. And Paul goes on to underline this. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I know some will focus on the list of sins, and it's fair enough to attend to them, but behind this is the truth of a will, a heart, which is either still bent on sin and worldly things, or a heart and a will that is washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of God. There is a great difference between the reign of the world in our hearts and wills and the reign of Jesus. These two wills and hearts are very different and destined for different ends. And in this life, they think and act differently. If our worldly thinking brings us to fighting each other or winning over each other, then we have lost sight already of the very kingdom and reign in our hearts that God calls us to. We need to live now in that kingdom and reign, under Christ's reign. Live now in his kingdom reign in preparation for its coming fullness. We need to make Christ king among us now with his reign in our hearts. We are washed sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So, try not to get into conflict, but do not be afraid to judge a matter, to help another believer sort out and live by heart things. Don't be afraid to ask another believer to help you sort things out and live by heart things either. So living in Christ, living in Christ-provided righteousness, is living with new values and priorities. It is living free of this world's worry and battles. And as you look ahead moment to moment with the Spirit, 
do what makes for righteousness, good conscience, true trust, and a singleness of will on Christ. This is real work on your own will at heart with God. Word gardening, I'll call it. Gardening your will and mind and heart with the Word of God. New values, new priorities, new Bible-taught thinking, and a new spirit, the Spirit of God. So go and guard in your heart with God's Word today. Your relationships, your fellowship with all the Christians around you. Remember what God intends for you in his kingdom, in which we will all reign with his reign in our hearts. Remember what he intends for you and for all those Christians around you to reign in in us and through us all. Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, forgive us for all our grudges, hurts, disputes, for all our lawsuits, whether real or in our hearts against each other. Beyond that, Lord, forgive us for all our worldly thinking and help us to establish in our hearts your reign so that from the heart we wish what you wish. We praise you, our Lord Jesus Christ, For we now understand better that heart of yours that gave up so much and did not consider even your equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but gave it up that you might save us. Lord Jesus Christ, reign in our hearts. Amen.